All right, thank you again, Rohit, and do good fundraising. I appreciate the presence. Again, I was talking with some of the people that are here, the attendees, and this is so much better than Zoom. I just <laughs> wanted to say that it's really good And again, if I'm standing weird, just let me know, because I'm used to just looking into a screen. So I don't even know how my body looks in person. <laughs> I'm gonna get back used to this. So again, my name is Ryan Knight, one of the co-founders of the Afro-Caribbean Business Network. And a little bit about myself, I do consider myself a serial social entrepreneur. So I run a social enterprise called Detailing Nights, which provides mobile, waterless car cleaning. So we go to houses, their offices, clean their cars on the spot without using any water, and our plant-based, eco-friendly cleaning supplies. And what I'm most proud of with Detailing Nights is actually we have a youth entrepreneurship program embedded into it. So high school students, college students, even those out of school, we work with youth coming out of detention. We show them they have the potential to start their own businesses and not just be an employee, but we also hire so they can either work with us or be their own boss. Uh, with Service Kingdom, it's a social enterprise, a social entrepreneurship consultancy firm that I run, and also executives power up. So we work with entrepreneurs that are ready to scale by giving them uh, access to an executive team. So a lot of times you don't have that CTO, CMO, C-level suite that you need to scale. So we actually work with them to give them those uh, tools. And one secret I'm letting out the bag, Black Panther's Cage is being developed. So think of Dragon's Den, but with black founders and black uh, analysts and venture capitalists all being able to support the community. But as I mentioned, I'm the co-founder of the Apple Caribbean Business Network. So about five years ago, we, well, myself, I saw a gap as I was growing detailing lights. We were looking to scale. We wanted to franchise across Canada and into the US, but there weren't a lot of black entrepreneurs black focused business organizations to tap into to help scale. A lot of them didn't have the mandate to scale up companies. So we brought six other entrepreneurs together. We said, could we create an entity that would sit down with an entrepreneur, figure out what stage they're in, and then help them create a strategy to grow their companies exponentially. Thus, ACBN Canada was born. We started with more info sessions and networking events. It's interesting to be here with Rohit because he is like my secret weapon with getting grants. And our first grantor is actually in the building, Daniel from Now Creative. So that five hundred dollar grant, he doesn't know the ripple effect that it had. So, but um, let's see what's next. So on this journey, we've been able to partner with some amazing organizations. And Susan Henry's in the room that has even been a support for myself with Detailing Nights, being able to get access to capital when it was difficult going to the traditional banks. But organizations also like Calabash, uh, SETC, ZSC, and Sheridan Edge, which stands for the Entrepreneurship Discovery and Growth Engine. One Full Circle, which we consider, well, they're like ACBN Quebec, and we're like One Full Circle Ontario, Dream Legacy Foundation, and the Toronto Community Benefits Network that again, Rosemary Powell showed uh, showed that she believed in the vision and from before ACBN was even born knew that we could put together something to support business owners in the community and again we exist to see the community win whether you're an entrepreneur or an executive director and we help to grow the enterprise and one thing just before I jump into our pillar actually I'm put it up. over these past five years we've been able to work with about 5,500 black entrepreneurs. What well, we're starting to see through our research that there's about 130,000 black entrepreneurs that are you know, running just Instagram accounts or from their basement, kind of under the radar. So out of those 130,000 black entrepreneurs, there's about 27,000 that are registered. So this is where our pillars, we see that entrepreneurship is a perfect tool to use to create community empowerment and to really create that economic inclusion as well because when we talk about entrepreneurship, and I typically say everybody should be an entrepreneur because if you're young, it's a perfect time to start a business. You still live at home, so if the business doesn't work out, at least you have somewhere to live. <laughs> even if you're working a career, you have your job, they talk about <coughs> entrepreneurship, but also have that additional income to bring in dollars to the bottom line of your household. So empowering yourself, and we see a lot of programs that are created that if you dig deep, you realize they don't actually empower the community. And that's where I find entrepreneurship is a perfect tool because research shows it's 12 times easier to pull yourself out of poverty by starting a business rather than just getting a job. 
But all that to say, one pillar that I'm, I really focus on is that access to funding. As Rohit mentioned, the search, and the, we've been studied to death, the research is done, black entrepreneurs have difficulty getting capital. So now what are we gonna do to alleviate that? And thanks to our partners with Alterna Savings, we've been able to create that microloan program. So we see loans being, or programs being launched, and then there's still gaps. So when we saw the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Program launched by the federal government, they were starting at 25,000 and going up. We said, hey, what happened to under 25,000? And again, Susan, I, she doesn't know the domino effect that she's created by allowing us to step into the social finance space because now we can really be at tables advocating for entrepreneurs that is really being missed. And again, we see programs that aren't really supporting entrepreneurs at the level that they're <laughs> So being able to create a solution and use a tool that empowers a person to support the community and then create generational wealth, this is where I feel like we really shine. And as I mentioned, we've been able to engage with about over 5,000 black entrepreneurs. We're seeing a lot of, I don't wanna call them under the table businesses, but people that are starting and not feeling that they need infrastructure. So out of 130,000, only 27,000 are registered. But what I'm most proud of is being able to partner with over 40 plus business focused organizations. As I mentioned five years ago, there might have been three, and now across Canada there's at least 40, and we've been able to work with them so that we're, whenever an entrepreneur engages with us, we can point them in the right direction, and ACBN doesn't have to feel we do everything, but we play a certain puzzle piece really well, and that puzzle piece, again, we're leaning to that scaling, how do we help entrepreneurs franchise, license, expand to multiple locations, and help them get the funding that we need. So all that to say, I want this is the first time I'm presenting the research findings publicly, so you're getting a sneak peek to the black labor market assessment that we were able to complete. Thanks to our partner, Setsi, and the Black Entrepreneurship Ecosystem, we were able to commission a black-owned research firm, Dunpierre and Barnett. They typically do migration patterns and uh, labor market assessments in the Caribbean and overseas. Not a lot of work in Canada, so we were able to kind of pull them back. They are based in Brampton, I used to live in Brampton. And so under our nose was a great resource, and that's where we were able to get the initial data on all these entrepreneurs that are working under the radar. So we were able to engage with almost 1,600 black entrepreneurs in Southern Ontario. We were doing focus groups, we sent out surveys, we called, we called so many people and talking to them and hearing their stories. And also, that's Ken, we got some info from them and other organizations like Face Coalition and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. But the Black Chamber of Commerce, being able to talk to entrepreneurs and really understand the journey that they've been on. We are also working with Sheridan College to do deeper research in Peel to really understand what those barriers are. And you'll see in Toronto was the majority of the respondents, Peel as well, and Durham, mm -hmm a lot of respondents. And you'll notice we did focus in southern Ontario, so now we are looking to expand our research to the rest of Ontario and across Canada. So some of the data points that I want to share with you today, one big piece that allowed us to start realizing why entrepreneurs are struggling, 86% of black entrepreneurs are in the one to four employees range. So out of those 27,000 registered businesses, we were able to talk to about 1,600, we're seeing 86% are actually considered nano businesses. So why does, this con why does this create a problem? So in Canada, we consider small business one to 49 employees. So a bank now is treating all employees or all entrepreneurs with kind of the same gloves. So an entrepreneur that comes in with two to three employees is being treated, treated the same as an entrepreneur that comes in with 40 plus employees. And we would know those two businesses are very starkly different. So now, when the funding and these programs are being created, the government's had a small business loan program for a long time, but again, it's called small business loans. So but when that entrepreneur goes to the bank and they only have two to three employees, or they're a solo entrepreneur, the risk that the bank sees them as is a lot higher than the entrepreneur that has 40 employees. So now, if we're structuring our businesses with only one to four employees and we can't get that capital because we look like high risk, that's one strike against us. This just shows kind of how much employees out of those that we surveyed are able to employ. So you notice the 
the majority are in the one to four, if we're able to encourage entrepreneurs to get into the 10 plus employee range, we're gonna be able to alleviate a lot of the unemployment in our own communities just by supporting the businesses that already exist to increase how, many they're, uh, how much they're able to hire. So now, the question of hiring. We're finding in our focus group that black businesses are struggling to find talent. So in the focus group, one thing that kind of made me step back is we asked the question, and this is with black unemployed people, people outside of the community that are unemployed, how likely are you to work for a black firm? 50% across the board said they were less than likely to even want to work at a black firm. And I slowed down and like, that makes no sense to me. You are from the community. We have jobs ready for you. Why wouldn't you want to work at a black firm? The responses that we're getting, we don't know if we're going to get paid on time. We're not going to get employee benefits or perks. Basically, the business is unstructured. And that goes back to the data that we're seeing. An entrepreneur that maybe is a solopreneur or has two or three employees usually doesn't have robust payroll systems. They typically do not have employee programs, benefits, and perks. So the fact that they're structured wrong is uh, causing the problem of not being able to fill these job vacancies, strike two. So just the way that we structure our businesses is stopping us from being able to grow. So you saw two slides ago, programs that are created, we're trying to work with entrepreneurs to improve their business plans, uh, make their operations great, and we tell them, hey, put up your job descriptions, but the perception in the industry or in the job market is that people do not want to work for black firms. So now we have a different issue. We actually have to make it desirable for the population to want to work at black firms. And that is something we didn't think of to incorporate that into our programs. So that to say, uh, we're seeing a lot of job openings, 58% uh, of non-black job, sorry, uh, non-job black seekers, non-black job seekers prefer not to work at black owned businesses. The great timing of this all is as we talked about how do we make it desirable for a person to want to work for a black firm. Of course, the structure is important, but also being able to offer employee benefits. The federal government, at the same time, I don't know if they heard what we were working on, but they are putting together a program to figure out how to turn the remittances that we already do, like CBP and EI, and include a way that entrepreneurs can get benefits for their employees. So stay tuned for that. I know it's really in the infancy of their research, but they are working on how to figure that out. One other piece is, as these entrepreneurs are trying to grow, they're looking at not just entry level uh, job positions. They're trying to find management staff, they're trying to find technicians, trying to find computer and IT support. So if these job openings were filled, you would see a lot of more entrepreneurs shifting out of that one to four tier and into 10 plus. But now that they're having difficulty hiring, they're stuck and they can't get capital because they're not growing. It's like a cash 22. So the third strike that I want to talk about, so those are two strikes. The first strike is we're structuring our businesses, thinking too small. And it's funny, I was having a conversation with Susan, she said the exact same thing. We as business owners are thinking too small. So we're stuck one to two employees. Second strike, it's difficult to find talent. We're not desirable to work at our firms. Now, it's what industries are we actually in? There's about 42 industries in total. There's 26 that black, on, black businesses are starting in. But we're seeing there's a concentration in professional services. So we are seeing 25% are in professional services. So that's typically accountants, lawyers, uh, consultants. Typically, they are the talent. We're seeing a high, a high amount of people graduating in our community with degrees. They definitely have the talent, but they're starting consultancy firms, and also they're in 19% arts entertainment. Uh, finance, real estate, or computer design. But because we're concentrating in professional services, banks don't like to back individual entrepreneurs. So if you go to the bank and say, I am the talent, I need money, I have no collateral, I have no equipment, I have nothing to back this loan with, strike three, the bank sees you as total high risk, and now it's very difficult to fund this person. So this is where we're seeing why even though we're starting to work on the anti-black racism, and I haven't even talked about systemic barriers that the federal government admits is baked into the banking industry, that's strike four. 
So I don't know what game we're playing, but if we get four strikes, I feel like we're going backwards. You just gotta pack up your team. So now that you're seeing the black, um, the black community, even though we're making headway with the banks, because the federal government said we have to fix how entrepreneurs are getting money from the banks, they tried, didn't quite work out. Now we're seeing black entrepreneurship loans roll out. So they're opening the doors, but because we're small, we have nano businesses, we are difficult to hire people, and we're in industries that are deemed high risk, it's still difficult to get capital from the banks. And this is what we're seeing with a lot of the black entrepreneur loan programs, is that even though, no matter what you call the program, you can call it sun sunshine, fairies, lollipops, when you get to the underwriter, the underwriter does not care. The underwriter, all they see is risk. And if they see any risk that'll affect their job, the person that's the gatekeeper, I hear as they're talking, they don't want to send bad loans to the underwriter because then they get blacklisted by the underwriter. <coughs> Whoever this mystic underwriter is, <laughs> they hold a lot of power. And we never get to meet them. They are just in the background in the high tower. But because we're deemed as high risk, we are having difficulty getting past that underwriter. And that's kind of the state. So one thing I want to share is the opportunity. Out of all this data, you'll see up below food and beverage products, construction. So construction is an industry that I don't even want to call a trend. We're always building, yet the black community is not engaged in the construction industry as much as we should be. The federal government, they're putting about $187 billion into infrastructure. Ontario alone wants to build 2.5 million homes. And that was before uh, the strong mayor they got that strong mayor and mayor Tory was talking about building even more homes. So we're on point to build a lot. We're building all the time. And so this is a trend that we should be engaged with. Yet, when I go back, the black community is focused on professional services and not engaging with construction. So this is a big piece as an organization. We want to start encouraging more businesses to get into industries that are actually trending forward, where money is being invested. With the help of Sheridan College, we've created a clean tech, kind of an incubator to get more people into the industry of clean tech. Again, $18 billion was in the last budget to put into clean infrastructure, and there's almost zero black businesses that I know of. Again, the percentages might be 0.2 or 1, but we're not engaging with where the money is going. And when I do my info sessions about grants, I talk all the time, there's money flowing all around us, it's time for us to position ourselves in front of that flow of money. So as we, and sorry, this is quickly all the different areas that we could support black entrepreneurs with. They need support with graphic designers, website designers, accountants. They need help with filling out these financial documents. What we're finding most often is when an entrepreneur is engaging with any financial institution, sometimes the questions that the underwriter is asking are valid. Can I see your three years financials? Can I see your cash tax savings? Can I see your NOA? Those aren't things that should be tripping us up. But because entrepreneurs are busy, because they're usually themselves or one other person, they're small, they don't have the time to structure everything properly. So as an organization, we're finding ways to create project teams for our entrepreneurs. So we can actually work alongside them to navigate all of the different hoops that they might be put through. So as I wrap, as I wrap up, uh, the recommendations that we're starting to talk to government officials about is one, continuing the research. We're able to, and the theme of my talk was actually how to use research to gain additional dollars. We got funded through the Black Entrepreneurship sure, Ecosystem. We now use this research that we're able to do to access, we're asking for about 7.5 million, and we're talking with FedDev to increase our funding to that level. So these are things that data allows you to do when you're able to capture and create or control your own narrative, instead of other organizations that are serving the black community that don't look like us, we can actually control our own narrative, control our data, use that data concisely into a presentation and access way more funding than we could just by programs that are made for us. So I do wanna, there's one thing that I wanted to say out there before I wrap. No, I think I said it already. So I would love to connect with anybody that wants to help us increase the research that we're doing. 
And also, if you're seeing black entrepreneurs struggling to get capital, please send them my way. We do have more options than just what's put in the media. And because we're able to grow what we do, we're able to actually fill gaps that entrepreneurs might face on their journey. But I thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Frank. Why don't we take some questions? Yes, sure. Um, so obviously you've run you run multiple different ventures. So I'm assuming that when you started ACBN, it was because of all the issues you faced and, and found. Where what other gaps exist, either in other like regions or jurisdictions, where there's not an ACBN, for example? Yeah, the good thing is because there's 40 organizations part of the ecosystem, and there's even more that do work that didn't get funded. We're seeing the same things out of Southern Ontario in other uh, provinces. The issue is if the province, of course, like Alberta, there might be representation in Edmonton, nothing in Calgary. So trying to figure out ways to create satellite service branches of ACPN in places that are missing. But we're starting, we started testing that in Southern Ontario first and say, hey, we go out to Hamilton, London, Ottawa, and also Durham, and we're already in Peel. So we're testing how to connect with community organizations because now the community organizations are working with people in the community. People might want to start, might want to start businesses, but they can't support them the best way. So we kind of become their division. So any gaps that people are seeing, we can fill it for them. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, this is going to be a bit of a reflection and a question. Yes. Right? Just, just prepping you for that, right? Um, first off, I appreciate the fact that you had summarized in terms of the intent of the presentation because initially it actually came off as to say this is where the gap is, this is where the industry needs to move, like for example, the construction example, um, where the reality of the circumstances is speaking as a black entrepreneur and also with the network of um, entrepreneurs within the ACB community, um, a lot of this information is not shared and it's very siloed when it comes to the services that are being made available to black entrepreneurs and those that are just within community development alone. So that's just in terms of that reflection. Speak, like speaking towards that, I'm interested to know, based on this network, what knowledge sharing opportunities may be there, whether it is at that micro level within the city of Toronto and also uh, provincially or nationally that can actually be developed to fortify that and how can we actually make sure that information like this is shared widely within our communities as well. 